In the Song of Solomon, chapter 7, there's a short verse, verse 6. How fair and how pleasant you are, O love, for delights. How fair and how pleasant you are, O love, for delights. There has been and will ever be a great chasm between the perceived reality that we experience and the truth. We look at things and we evaluate them according to our customs, according to our abilities, according to our prejudices. And we decide which things are acceptable, which things are proper, and which things are not. I remember speaking to an individual who was of a few generations earlier than me, and she said, none of these things would have been accepted when I was a child. That's not because the truth doesn't exist, it's because perception. These were the things that in my day were perceived to be improper, and today that barrier has moved. And that's the way man is. We have been given by God a natural penchant to evaluate things, to look at things, and to conclude and speculate whether this is right or this is wrong. And it does not matter what the word is that we use, every one of them has a category. What's delicious? What's pleasant? What's obnoxious? What's offensive? What is sweet? What is bitter? What is hot? What is cold? Everything has a relative attachment specific to the individual. And therefore, we have conclusions that turn into doctrine, that turn into axioms which become sacred cows of how this is right, this is wrong. The word that is used here, how fair and how pleasant you are, comes from the pen of a man who was given an amazing gift. Solomon was given of God the wisdom to know. And his wisdom far exceeded anyone here on earth. So much so that everybody came to hear His Proverbs, they came to hear him handle tough questions, to make decisions, to handle judicial matters. He was the epitome of wisdom here on this earth. And with that, God gave him an earnest desire. And I often, well, when I was raised through the Sunday schools and all that kind of stuff, Solomon was this beautiful figure. He was a holy man. He was a righteous man. We need to just concentrate on the second part. He was a man. Drawn away of like passions as every one of us. And God gave him the desire to seek out everything that made a man happy. Now, there again we have an amazing little uh, word there. Happy. You know, we have a uh, phrase in our Constitution which has caused so much trouble in this land and will continue to because it says that every man is endowed with certain inalienable rights by the Creator for the pursuit of life, liberty, or for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness? The deviations of one are the happiness of another. There is no constant there. But God gave um, Solomon... To seek after some things. And when you give a man who has all this wisdom and understanding the earnest desire to seek after things, it becomes a most amazing adventure. 
And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and to know folly. And I perceived that all of this was painful to my spirit. You know, this is time where you put a little smile on your face and say, well, you know, why didn't you stop? Well, the man goes to the doctor and says, it, hurt, I hurt, it hurts when I do this. Well, then don't do that. But he gave himself to know all these things, and he found out that it was painful. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. He gave himself to know all the things that made a man happy. He gave himself to know what made a man sad. What man delighted in. And the reason I'm laboring on this is because God gave this individual the understanding, he didn't do this blindly, the understanding to search out the inner recesses of the heart and mind of man and investigate every dark crevice there is. Every black hole that could possibly be. And as if someone might say, well, you're making that up, we go to the book of Ezekiel and uh, Ezekiel goes and takes a light with him and he digs a hole in the wall and the spirit says, and what do you see? He says, an abomination. He says, I haven't seen anything yet. Dig another hole. What do you see? A worse abomination. You're going to see greater than that. Dig another hole. And whereas this sounds like a good uh, castigation of the Jewish nation and their religious sentiments, I believe Ezekiel was being shown what the truth is about the natural man, about Adam. And those dark recesses where greater and greater abominations dwell is what Solomon saw and Solomon understood and Solomon loved many women. Ain't no blame to the women. You know, if we go back to the garden and we say, here's Adam and Eve, they have the knowledge of good and evil, and they go over and they take the fruit of the tree and eat it, you look at him and you say, you knew better. You had the knowledge. But that's not what happened. They, had, they did not have the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, in innocence, they followed the degree, decree of God and sin entered into the world. And they fell guilty. Solomon has all this wisdom. He has all the writings where God says, look, don't involve yourself with the women of the world. And he gives his heart to know all things that makes a man happy. He had every exotic woman he wanted. He had every ambition and every vice that he could think of. And it doesn't matter to go into anything because he said, I gave my heart to know all things. Let the imagination go. And yet this man writes a a statement here, a love letter. How fair and how pleasant. Now, we could stand here and say, well, Solomon, you did all the research. How about you let us know how fair and how pleasant. But this is not Solomon, the man that's writing. This is the king of peace who is writing about his beloved. He says, you are the fairest of all women. He gives a comparison. And his comparison is, there is no one, no one on this earth that can compare unto you in beauty. You see, we're back to the evaluations of man, what's beautiful. But the truth And the truth is, you are beautiful. You are pleasant. You are the agreement of all beauty and fairness. You know, like everything just comes together in the epitome of beauty and and fairness. You are fair and pleasant. 
Is this God looking down and saying, you know, I've waited a long time for you people to get it right. All those years with them people in the wilderness, all those years with the temple, the sanctuary, and all this stuff, finally, you got it together? Not in the least bit. Not in the least bit. Because he says, there is no spot in you. No defilement. He didn't say, hey, you fixed yourself up nice. You know, a little makeup, baby, look good. No. No. The epitome of beauty. The perfection of cleanliness. Because she is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. To consider anything in a diminished capacity of this beloved who is the bride, who is the church, who is his body is to consider that there is a blemish in him. As I said before, we go back to the garden and we see God created man in his image and he created male and female, created he them, showing that the bride was always in Adam until the time that God separated them. And that's the type. That's the perceived reality. What's the truth? The truth is that she has always been in the beginning. She has always been in eternity, one in Him. So it's not a matter of you have made yourself fair. It's not a matter of you have gone to your charm school and you have cleaned yourself up and you look real nice and you grew up and all that kind of stuff. It's an axiom That is stated by the king of peace. Now, if we back up into chapter 6 there, there's a verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return that we may look upon upon you. The question is, what do you see in the Shulamite? The answer is, as it were, a company of two armies. Now, I bring that up because the king of peace is the one who is writing this Let Solomon, the king of peace. And he is speaking to his beloved, whom he calls a Shulamite. Now, we all know what that is. That's a common word we always use. But you'll humor me if I let you know that the meaning of the word is the perfection of, of the perfection of peace. Perfect peace. The king of peace desires to look upon the perfection of peace because of what she has done? Not in the least bit. We have been justified by faith, therefore we have peace with God. And that's not a peace that's of this world, and it's not a peace of understanding. It's a peace that exceeds all understanding. It's perfect peace. The king of peace looks upon perfect peace. And he says, I see, as it were, the company of two armies. Now, there have been those who have thrown a little dispensational arsenic on here and said, oh, that's Old Testament, New Testament. There are others who have said, well, that is um, the old man and the new man. Well, I, I beg your indulgence here, but how do you have peace when you have the old man and the new man involved? There's enmity there. And Paul said, I find a a warfare going on. So that can't be what that's talking about. What about the gospel and the mystery of the gospel? Because later on in the chapter, we we are told that we have a younger daughter, a younger sister. The mystery of the gospel, that all nations should be partakers of the same spirit and the same promise. But this is a majestic Grand display, as it were, you know, you've seen the parade, you've seen the the banners go down. Well, this is an array of banners and streamers and just a great host, an amazing group of people. How amazing? John said, I saw 7,000 redeemed by the Lamb. 
Then I saw a host which no man could number, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, if they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, they're at peace with God. And if they're at peace with God, there has never been a time when they were not at peace with God, which is the perfect peace. This is the Shulamite. You are perfect. There is nothing wrong with you. You tune in any station, you're going to hear somebody wants to tell you what's wrong with the church. And anybody who wants to ask what's wrong with the church, I'll tell you right now. You want to see what's wrong with the church? You look at the members that are shown here on this earth. And every one of them who have been taught of the Spirit is going to say, here's the problem right here. It's Adam. Because I can't control him. I can't find any peace. I can't find any comfort. That's because the reality of this illusion of existence is not the truth. The truth is, there was never a time in which the church had any spot or any blemish. And when he put on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, and he finished the work before the foundation of the world, before time began in eternity, so she was granted to be adorned in the fine linen, pure and white. She never sat off to the side and waited. But there was a time when she was obscured. There's always a time when she's obscured. In the time of this existence, awake, awake, stand up, shake off the dust. You know the old saying, if you run with dogs, you're going to get fleas. Well, she has been made partaker of flesh and blood, and dwells amongst this earth, dwells upon this earth. And in the time appointed to the Father, he calls to her, to the weak, put on your beautiful garments. Now, we consider that how we put on the beautiful garments, we go to Zechariah. Because here's the head, Joshua. He's the head of the body. He's the beloved. He's the salvation of Jehovah. He stands before the throne of God and he's got all filthy garments. Why? Because he who knew no sin became the sin of his people. God didn't say to him, okay, listen, you know, you need to be more presentable when you come to me. He said, take away the filthy garments. He satisfied the demands. He's met all the criteria. He's the perfect salvation. He's the perfect sacrifice. And the law is satisfied and I am well pleased. You give him a change of raiment. And when he received the change of raiment, it was granted unto her to be arrayed in the fine linen, and pure and white that she was clothed upon in the righteousness of the saints. You are fair. You are beautiful. You are brilliant. There's another word that fits in here very properly, and that's the word brilliant. How bright is bright? I don't know about you, but the older I get, bright becomes really uh, a question. Brilliant, glorious, splendid. All words which man can put all kinds of definitions and degrees of limitations upon. But the truth cannot be diminished. You are brilliant. How brilliant is the church? Well, we go to the book of John and the Lord prays and he says, I've done the work which you've given me. I finished it. Glorify me with the glory that I had in you before the world was. I've given them your word that they may be one as we are one. And the glory of the Father is the glory of the beloved. Is there any difference between the absolute perfection of beauty of God and His bride? Not if they were one. 
There could be no difference. Isaiah tells us, look unto the rock from which you were hewn. Is there any time that you could take a piece of the rock and go back and say, no, that didn't fit here? You go back to the rock and say, no, it doesn't fit here. You got the wrong rock. You take the chip off the block and go back to the block. It fits in the chip. Or the chip fits. And it's identical to the composition and the manner of that block. Look unto the rock from which you're hewn. The church is no different. She is the brilliance and the glory of God. She is the radiance of His righteousness. And she is the beautiful agreement of all comfort. Amos asks asks a question. He says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Many have taken that verse and have said, you know, we all have to come together on this. We all have to be of the same mind in this matter. We need to talk this over and come to a resolution so we can walk together. But once again, that's not what Amos said. Coming into agreement is not being agreed. Being agreed is a state of being, not a state of mind. The bride here, how fair, how pleasant you are, O love. The beauty of agreement. In other words, everything in the church is harmoniously interwoven to work together for good. Everything. Now, we look at this world and we say, this place is a mess. Every generation before us has said it, and every generation after us is going to say say the same thing. This place is a mess. It's getting worse. That's why the Lord said, don't be going around saying, oh, remember the former days, how wonderful they were. He's made everything beautiful in its own time. He, the same power that spoke everything into existence, decreed... That this earth should be empty and without form. Then he fashioned it specifically to bring forth all things necessary, especially earthen vessels. One which has been outfitted for destruction, the other one who has been foreordained unto the glory of receiving the eternal seed. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. But I do know. This was his will. The revelation tells us he created all things for his good pleasure. He told the beloved here, my desire is upon you. I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. He created all things for his good pleasure. He created Esau. He created the crooked serpent. He created the winds, the waves. He created the trials, the hardships. And He created the earth and sustained it until such time as it was necessary to destroy it. He set the times of our habitations, the boundaries and the limitations, and He didn't do it because He's a man with an ant farm to see how He can make us react. He did it because my desire is upon you, a child of grace, being made subject To this vanity, to see the emptiness of this world, to realize this is painful. There's nothing here that is profitable. There's nothing here that sustains. It is sorrow. It is anguish. And to constantly desire the time when it's over. And it will be over. It will be over when the labors that have been assigned have been finished And the time appointed has arrived. And you know what? There's not a person who can change it. Not a person who can amend it. This is the way that God has decreed all things for His good pleasure. And by the power of His will, He brings it together, brought it together, and has ordained it, and has caused it to be harmoniously interwoven 
together. It doesn't take much to look and say, eh, I don't see how this works together. I don't see these two factions coming together. As we spoke earlier, I don't see these two events suddenly changing course, as it were, and resulting in something amazing. We don't have the mind of God. We don't have the eyes to see what God has decreed. And in Adam, we don't care, because he has put in our minds the cares for the things of this world. And that's why we look on the things that are temporal. That's why we judge all things by that which is temporal. That's why we can say, oh, you see this here? Well, this that was uh, an aberrant a few years ago, we're going to say is beautiful now. But when it comes to the axioms of the absolute nature of God, the beauty of His holiness, the perfection, He says, I have done all these things, made you subject to this vanity, put you through these trials, laid my hand on top of you, and pressed down in tribulation. I have done all these things because I love you, and I want to show you that love. This is beyond understanding, because it doesn't make sense. Like I said, we go back to the perception of reality, but the truth stands. And the truth stands that she is adorned in the righteousness, His righteousness. She is one in Him. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with her. The words are used many times through this book. This fair, pleasant. And he constantly, back and forth, she refers to him, he refers to her. And he says to her, he calls her the fairest among women. And I, I don't like that because it sounds like here's a group of women and she's in the middle. She's the fairest among the women. But what it means is that take all the women of all the centuries of all time, of all creation... They don't compare to the beauty of the bride of Christ. That's the comparison that Paul said when he said, I was lifted up into the third heaven and I saw things that I don't have the words for. And if I had the words, you couldn't understand them. And if I had the words and you understood the words, you couldn't understand what I saw because it's unlawful for man to see the beauty of the holiness of God. That's why it's so difficult when we look at these testimonies. Ezekiel chapter 1. I saw these visions of God and they give all these amazing creatures. And this is the way Ezekiel was given to relay it to us. The fact is not, oh, we've got a cow here and we've got an eagle here and we've got wings over here. That's not the point. The point is the all-inclusive nature of our God. There is nothing outside of him. And if everything is contained within our God, what of his bride? Is she inferior? No. She is one in him. This examination that we hear going on, which is depressing, it is. Young man stood here a number of weeks ago. Wanted to tell me what was wrong with the church. I'll tell you what's wrong. As a good friend of mine said, I wouldn't want to be a member of any group that would have me as a member. There's your answer. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with the church. It never has been, and it never will be. By the grace of God, the Spirit give us that comfort. By the grace of God, the, Lord, the, the Spirit, give us that understanding. I tried to sit and think about this once, and the headache was pretty good. The tapestry of the curtains of the uh, t- tabernacle. 
All those little threads going through, back and forth, back and forth. Then every now and then a red one went through. And then a blue one went through. And on one there was the image of a cherubim. But I, I wanted, I was looking at that one thread. You know, if you were standing back and the tabernacle was in front of you and all these curtains, you couldn't see that thread. You couldn't see that little red thread in there. You couldn't see the blue thread. But the there. You couldn't see how each one of the threads came together, how they were interwoven, what their placement was, or why God put them there. But the fact doesn't get changed that they're there. And everything that goes on in our lives, everything that comes to pass is part of the thread that He has interwoven into our lives. I know that's a great pat on the back for self-assurance. See, I have a place in the universe. If a child of grace, I am known as the king of the universe. And I have been loved by him. And that eternal love has decreed what is best for me. And he has caused me to walk the path that he has given me. And he has ca- given me the labors that are necessary according to his will. No unemployment here, by the way. And he has done all these things for the praise and glory of his name, which is the praise of of his church, of his bride. You are beautiful. You're perfect. You are the harmonious agreement of all things. You are the perfect peace. And no one can approach you. No one can touch you. No one can blemish you. I pray the Lord would give us comfort in these words. I apologize for the incompetence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know our eyes are drawn away after the things that go on around us. And these eyes cannot see your wondrous working in all things. But we pray that the Spirit would cause us to lift up the hands and praise your name because you indeed our King of kings and Lord of lords and has reigned over all things supreme. We thank you for the demonstration of your love for your beloved and that you have done all these things because of your desire for her. We thank you for the examples that you have left for us in the testimony of the scriptures. We pray the Spirit would give us understanding and comfort in these things in the midst of of all the confusion and turmoil that is going on about us. We thank you for our time together. We pray your spirit give us understanding. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.